Thank you, and I, I think we can all agree that was uh, amazing three presentations, um, you know, really reflecting the partnership and uh, reflecting David's commitment to partnership. Um, I, I'm shaking up here, but that's largely because I'm the last year before drinks. Um, <laughs> Um, but perhaps that was better than being this morning where I've been shaking here because I've been cold. Um, <laughs> but um, on a serious note, um, the, this session will extend to 5.30. Um, so you won't miss out on drinks, and those drinks will be from 5.30 to 6 p.m. So I hope you can hang in with us today because we've got some great presentations coming up from, um, from Gail and Basil. So my name's Rebecca Guy, and um, I'm head of the Surveillance Evaluation and Research Program at the Kirby Institute. Um, I was appointed um, around three years ago now and also recently be a, um, promoted to a professor. And I mention that specifically because of the support of David Cooper in both those, um, both those appointments. Um, I remember when I was appointed at the head of program, uh, it was about six months after and I was called to David's office for my first meeting with him and I was quite nervous. Um, our illustrious leader, what was I going to say? Um, and I remember with Jane Costello, who's the program manager of um, our program, and she helped me prepare endless reams of paperwork and things that I could say to David and talking about future direction. And when I arrived in his office, I think we spent the first 20 minutes talking about grandchildren. <laughs> um, and I, I think there was many comments today about um, David talking with Dory and his children, but in, in recent years, um, we, I looked through many pictures of, of grandchildren, which was, um, which was quite lovely. Um, part of the conversation with David was about um, my work and, um, in the future and that focused on sexually transmitted infections and I think that's a nice segue into the next part of the session which is about other work that Kirby's involved in which is sexually transmitted infections and also hepatitis. Um, so I've got great privilege to introduce Basil Donovan. Basil's the head of the sexual health program at the Kirby Institute and founder of the program. Um, he doesn't need much introduction but um, Basil's across everything, <laughs> from the laboratory, clinical to public health. Um, he's involved in many committees. Um, he's seen in the media, often making um, strong commitment and making change in policy and practice. And uh, for those who know Basil, he's always good for a story, which hopefully we'll hear today. So um, look forward to hearing you, Basil. <laughs> Thanks, Beck. You can all relax, it's a very data-like presentation. Uh, acknowledging the time of the day. Uh, today I'm just gonna briefly uh, talk about the so social and political uh, constraints that occur around STI vaccines and uh, some of my personal experience of it. This is the context of the fact that uh, there are over a million new curable STIs every day on this planet. Um, they dominate our national infectious disease statistics, yet there are so few vaccines in the pipeline. Um, we've achieved a lot in some areas, and we're doing very poorly in others. Now, I should have been forewarned. I went to a conference in Chicago back th over 30 years ago, they got the guest speaker who was a great scientist working on serial vaccines. He didn't mention gonorrhea. Um, so someone asked him, what about a gonococcal vaccine? And you can see his response. That is the societal response, um, particularly in parts of the USA. Uh, the vaccines shouldn't actually be encouraged because they will promote promiscuity. But we have done very well in some areas. Hepatitis B is overwhelmingly a sexually transmitted infection uh, in, adult, in your adult years, but it's never talked about as an STI. Um, and essentially, we've done incredibly well getting the bulk of the planet vaccinated in recent years, which is terrific. And we're getting, we get the biological benefits of it. These are um, gay men first presenting to the Sydney Sexual Health Centre, and you can see if they're in the youngest age groups, oh, you can't see that anyway, um, there's virtually no signs of past infection. Most of the men arrive already vaccinated, which they, they were as school children, and we see no clinical hepatitis B <laughs> other than in people who were ver infected through vertical transmission, uh, usually in Southeast Asia long before, which is a fantastic success story. Amongst gay men, hepatitis A is also a sexually transmitted infection, though most people get vaccinated for travel purposes. 
Um, and we used to see big waves of hepatitis A outbreaks in here in Sydney, you know, with uh, 1,500 to 2,000 cases in a, in a row, usually over about 18 months. Um, but we haven't seen one now for 20 years. We get the old little cluster, uh, where someone brings the infection back from overseas, maybe transmits a couple more. But we've actually done some modelling at the Kirby to show that we're around about the level of vaccination we need to guarantee no further major outbreaks. <laughs> and then this fantastic new vaccine came along in 2006, and this well-known climate change denier was our health minister at the time. And he took grave offence to the human papillomavirus vaccine. Uh, and this is a common mentality all across the United States. And as you can see, uh, to this day, I wonder whether his daughters ignored him and went out and got, got vaccinated anyway. But I think they seem pretty smart and they probably did. Um, fortunately, those, that was the days when there was actually political leadership in Canberra. And uh, the real heroine of the story was Janet Howard, who outed herself as having had cancer of the cervix. And her husband turned around to his health minister and said, shut up, Tony, and vaccinate Australia. It's a fantastic vaccine that approaches 100% efficacy. We're never going to see a vaccine as good as this again. Uh, even then, the federal government was reluctant to call, cause it, call it a an HPV vaccine that was marketed initially, at least, as a cancer vaccine. But we got the largest, most rapid vaccination program in the world. All Australian women up to the age of 26 were eligible for free vaccination, and most of them um, took up the offer. And we, and since then, since 2013, we've become the first country in the world to actually offer free vaccination to schoolboys as well. And you can see the vaccination coverage in girls is now around about 80%, which is uh, terrific. And the boys are rapidly catching up, just doing fun things. And only slowly uh, around the world are vaccination programs getting out, but uh, hundreds of millions of women are, have been vaccinated globally. Uh, lots of vaccine programs have fallen over because all around the world there are these modern bioterrorists called anti-vaccination -vaccin people. Uh, but we will persist. What effect has this had? Well, look inside the little red box. On the left is prevalence of the types of HPV that are targeted by the vaccine before the vaccine came along. And on the right, is the, the red column, is the prevalence uh, really just a few years after the vaccine program rolled out. Uh, and a little exciting thing is the brown columns, that's actually unvaccinated women. So what's, what this uh, slide is telling us is that the vaccinated women are protecting the unvaccinated women. It's called a herd effect. And this is the proportion of women presenting to our sexual health clinic. This is a, nat a national network with genital warts on their first visit. And you can see, even though it's just an 80% vaccination coverage, it's a 96% decline in the prevalence of genital warts um, amongst the youngest women, that is the most vaccinated cohort. I love these sorts of graphs. <laughs> and guess what? They're protecting their boyfriends. This is before the vaccination program uh, had any effect in boys, and you can see a better than 90% decline in genital warts in the youngest men. This is one of the most profound herd effects that ever demonstrated, and rapid. The precursor to cancer of the cervix is high-grade cervical abnormalities, and as you can see, this was very early on, this was by 2009, in the youngest girls having pap smears, those under the age of 18. That, that high-grade abnormalities were practically disappearing. And at a national level, um, uh, you can see the youngest, therefore most vaccinated women 
uh, there's this relentless decline in high rates of eye abnormalities being reported nationwide. Now, we've done some modelling at the Kirby Institute oh, uh, with, a, sorry, with a group in Quebec. Um, uh, this was actually a study to see whether there was any advantage in vaccinating women up to 26, because most pla places only vaccinated girls up to about age 15 or perhaps 18. And you can see we've got a big advantage. Um, uh, we, we can expect to see cancer cervix halve over about the next 40 years. And it's sort of the expanded vaccination program pushed that along by about 10 years. Uh, and now this is actually modelling with the four valent vaccine, which only covers, prevents about 70% of the cancer of the cervix. The new nine valent, which comes out, which was launched this year, should prevent more than 90% of cases of cancer of the cervix. So what's in the pipeline for other infections? Well, it's not a happy story. Most of the activity is cluttered or down around the sort of preclinical stage. Is that, uh, only, only a limited number of sort of phase one trials or you know, um, uh, tweak, tweaking of antigens to try and get some sort of response. Uh, a lot of the activity is around herpes. And, I think it's, um, and that's probably just because of the sheer numbers of cases. Uh, it may well be that if we ever do get a chlamydia vaccine, it will be given to us by the, um, uh, the chlamydia, uh, the, the koala people, because there's a lot more, there's a lot more philanthropic money around for koala vaccines. <laughs> um, a, yeah, again, it's only in the area of herpes where there are phase two trials which are looking at uh, uh, likelihood that it will be a successful vaccine. And there's nothing currently at the phase three level. And this is why there's some market interest in genital herpes, because your market is in hundreds of millions. And then, we got this report last year from in The Lancet, uh, where they followed up a cohort of uh, young New Zealanders, I think they vaccinated about they gave out about a million doses in New Zealand about 20 years ago because they had a meningitis B vaccine uh, outbreak. Uh, and that was an early, let's see, MENZB vaccine. Uh, and they followed those, those kids up to see what happened to them in terms of acquiring gonorrhea. And what they noticed when in the uh, sexual health clinics in New Zealand was that. Um, uh, People who'd had the vaccine, because they were all on a register, were 31% uh, less likely to present with um, gonorrhea than if they hadn't had the vaccine, whereas there was no effect on chlamydia. Uh, and now that vaccine is now evolved into a more sophisticated product called Bexero, which has additional antigens which are predicted to be likely to have some effect against gonorrhea. Now, you don't need a 100% effective vaccine for sexually transmitted infection because these infections don't hang around on doorknobs or toilet seats. They have to go from one susceptible person to another susceptible person. So partial efficacy is all you need. And uh, our modeling group at the Kirby showed that uh, efficacy as little as 20% can halve your prevalence of infection over the course of um, a couple of decades. So 30% is pretty exciting. So quick as a shot, I approached GSK, the vaccine manufacturer, put in an application to run a vaccine trial, a phase 3B, which is code for something that's already been for a, a trial for a new, a new application, it would be one of the quickest and cheapest vaccine trials in history with one of the most definitive answers. Because we've got a cohort of men on prep 42% of whom are catching gonorrhea each year. Um, so you don't need a big trial for that. Um, and we've already got them locked into three monthly screening for SDIs. Um, and we figured we could actually get an outcome in as little as, as little as 18 months. And on top of that, we could do a whole genome sequencing of any breakthrough infections so that the vaccine could perhaps be tweaked to make it more efficacious down the track.
the response of the company? They don't want their lovely product tainted with the SDI label. Once again, marketing beats science. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.